What is this? It's like um, that, that scene in Star Wars. You know, remember A New Hope when it's like... We have to get the pipe and yeah, hold it so the yeah, water's yeah, coming. Yeah. Quick, help me! The walls are closing in! In today's episode of Bike Fit Tuesdays, five tips for choosing and setting up your cycling shoes. We're back! Woohoo! <laughs> Tip number one, choose a shoe that fits your foot. Well, it's kind of obvious, but it's crazy the amount of people that get it wrong. I think the, the first thing, and the most important thing, is that we've got to buy a shoe that fits. Now, it does sound glaringly obvious. If you've got a wide foot, you need to buy a wide fitting shoe. If you've got a narrow foot, you need to buy a narrow fitting shoe. I think it's important to understand that not all shoes fit the same, not even within the same brand. So, Lake, for example, one of the more entry level shoes, the CX238, is a very, very wide fitting shoe. Next model up, CX332, is a much narrower fitting shoe. There are then wide fitting versions of each. So it can be a bit of a, a, a minefield in that respect. One of the best ways of, of determining whether you've got narrow or wide feet is going into a shop that measures your feet. Uh, using a Brannock device. It's the age-old means of measuring feet uh, in both uh, uh, length, arch length, and width. If you don't have access to one of these, uh, it, one good way of doing it might be to just uh, look at your feet. If you've got wide duck feet, then you need a wide fitting shoe. If you don't have wide duck feet and you've got skinny feet, you need a narrow fitting shoe. So if someone doesn't have access to a local bike shop that does really good shoe fitting, what can they do themselves? Not to uh, shout out a one brand, but Lake does actually have a really great uh, system on their website for uh, for outlining and measuring your feet so you basically draw around your foot you measure the, the longest point the widest point and lake has a i think they've got a table or something on their website that helps you diagnose which size might be best for you and also i think which last might be best for you that might be a really good starting point for a lot of people uh, i think trial and error can, can be a good way but usually with trial and error it's carried out in an uninformed fashion people just go and buy you know six different shoes from six different brands all in a size 45 and actually different size different brands come up differently in terms of sizing so uh, a lake for example comes out relatively small or we might even argue true to size certainly some of the physique models come up seeming seemingly quite a lot bigger uh so it's worth noting that you know not all not all shoe sizing is exactly the same there are also a number of businesses online uh, that will offer remote help so for example we offer you uh, offer a remote shoe fitting service whereby you measure your feet you, you you draw around your feet you measure the, the the narrowest and widest sorry the longest and widest point take photographs and send them in and uh, we'll try and help you with a pair of shoes that, that might fit as best as arch support i've said it before i'm going to say it again in the ski industry and this is more a testament to the professionalism or lack thereof of the bicycle industry but in skiing you are considered a moron if you ski with any level of regularity and you don't have arch support in your ski boots. Yet we have legions of cyclists riding around with something like this inside their shoes. Everybody needs arch support in their cycling shoes. There are lots of different uh, offerings out there. We know which one I prefer, but we'll come on to that later. Uh, I think we'll sort of group them into little in, into different categories. There's, first up, there's a, there's a full custom system, the most popular being uh, made by CDAS. The benefit of this system is that it's completely customized to your foot. Uh, the problem with it is that it's only as good as the person that makes it. So someone who's been on a three-day course has no experience and just has the tooling isn't gonna make you a very good pair of footbeds compared to someone who has been doing it for, for decades. Secondly, there are a whole plethora of off-the-shelf options. Uh, the most popular that you'll see in shops will be the Specialized BG, Superfeet, uh, Bontrager does one, Ergon does one. Basically these are all, we don't have an example of them here, but they're, they're all a, a sort of off-the-shelf footbed. They usually come in three or four different heights of arch support uh, and they can, be, they can be quite effective provided that the arch support's in the right place. Now this is the problem, is that the arch support isn't movable. So my, in my experience, generally speaking, I've found the, in particular with the specialized ones because they're the most commonly used most people end up riding the blue level which is the middle one because the green although although the green is usually the the right height it actually ends up in the wrong place the arch support actually ends up in the wrong place which is what brings us on to our third system which is the g8 it's a modular arch support comes with five different arch pieces or different arch heights it can be moved uh forwards backwards and medially and laterally. So uh, this is kind of midway between a fully custom footbed and off the shelf one because... Yes, 
Um, in, in, in a bike fitting environment, we, we vastly prefer this because it allows us to uh, get feedback from the rider on where we need to apply different levels of support and where. So for example, and we're going, a slight, I'm slightly digressing here now, but in, it, with wedging in bike fitting, it can be applied inside the shoe, outside the shoe, in the heel or in the forefoot. Uh, using this system because it's consistent and most people's feet are different uh, it allows us to get m some feedback from where we need to apply more support. Generally speaking everyone needs our support in their shoes uh, there are there are a couple of different reasons why there is a biomechanical element to it prevents it can prevent arch collapse pronation and thus improve general stability through the foot the knee the hips and the pelvis our uh, opinion is it's actually a more proprioceptive element. There's a more proprioceptive element to it uh, in that it helps re-establish connection between the brain and the feet that's lost when you put your foot into a cycling shoe. To that end, we found that we can reduce pressure going through the saddle by up to 50% just by putting arch support in your shoes. So all those people out there with saddle issues, probably not your saddle. Finally, I think we should point out that most of the insoles that come with cycling shoes are a little bit uh, unsupportive. Lindsay. So some of them are better than others, though. I think we should we should point out that Giro, I think, does a does a really does a. I was about to say really good. It's not really good. It's but it's better than nothing. It's a bit more like a volume filler, uh, which is also adjustable. I think Shimano does it as well, don't they? They've got a fairly big arch. Yeah. Thing. That that one that you just had though. This is this is probably something that actually might be worth talking about a little bit. This is a Lake Carbon Fiber Custom Moldable Jobby. Uh, which is super low volume and uh, like I say, you, you bung it in the oven, heat it up and it molds the inside of your feet. I don't sell that many of these. I, I, I prefer the G8, but on occasions where the G8 doesn't work, which is rare, uh, this is usually our, our, our second, second option. Get a stiff sole. Why would you want a stiff sole? A cycling shoe sole wants to be as stiff as possible. They're usually made out of one of two materials. A, uh, we prefer a carbon fiber, which is more on that in a minute. And there is also uh, a plastic. Sometimes there's a, you get, as, as is the case with this shoe, uh, you get like a carbon reinforced plastic. I prefer carbon fiber because generally speaking, the sole is made to be a lot, lot thinner uh, because carbon is a lot stiffer. The problem with the plastic sole is that it has to be comparatively quite a lot deeper in order to retain the stiffness. The problem with that is that uh, it has a similar effect to having to lengthening the crank arm length. So what, what I mean is as you come through the top of the stroke, it can start to impinge the hips, which th there's a biomechanical element to this. So uh, it generally, ultimately it will impact your efficiency. But why do you want a stiff sole in the first place? This is a shit lever. It's comprised of lots of different bones very dense capillary structure, it's very mobile. If you have a soft sole, it doesn't offer, it doesn't provide sufficient support to the foot. You end up putting quite a lot of pressure through the forefoot, through the very small bones of the forefoot, and you can end up with numb feet and what have you. But generally instability that occurs at the foot refers up through the knees, the hips, and the pelvis. So again, and we've sort of referenced this earlier, that uh, it can end up with ramifications and things like the saddle. So the sole is also generally much better for power transfer, power delivery, uh, so less power will be absorbed in the flex of the shoe. So what sort of price point can people find a shoe that you would consider stiff enough to use for uh, long distance riding? Cycling shoes are generally quite expensive. Where, where can people look? Cycling shoes are expensive. I think it's important, important to point out that the cycling shoe, a cycling shoe, is the most important part of your equipment. It can, it's going to make a bigger difference to your life than those carbon wheels you're eyeing up or an electronic group set because, like I say, it's where all the power goes or doesn't, as the case usually is. But to answer your question, I tend to, I mean, in here we don't stock anything below £200 on the grounds that the, and the cheapest shoe we sell is a City Genius 10, which is a carbon reinforced plastic sole. I don't stock anything cheaper than that because I, to be honest, I, I don't believe in it. Uh, I don't believe in the thickness of the sole and I don't believe in the, act, the lack of support provided. Uh, so to answer your question, I, I, would, I would try to look at around £200 for a pair of cycling shoes. That would be a, a good starting point. As far as entry level shoes are concerned, cities are pretty good uh, because the sole, even on the very, even on the low end models, is super stiff, super rigid, and it's also relatively, relatively thin still. I think probably the worst shoe I've encountered, and I had a gentleman come in with a pair recently, is um, is, a, is a muddy fox shoe. 
which uh, the sole is so soft you can fold it in half. You literally, I mean, you can actually do, actually these are stiffer. These are actually stiffer. Was the person with the quirk? <laughs> Look, I found a pair of shoes for you. So the variety of different closures in cycling shoes, uh, there are, there's a lace-up closure, which I'm, I'm afraid we don't have here, but I think everybody knows what laces are. The benefit of the lace-up system is that it allows you to micro-adjust uh, pressure, like an even pressure over the top of the foot. Obviously, the, the difficulty with it is that you can't adjust them on the fly. Tying a pair of laces when you're riding a bicycle, I mean, I haven't tried, but I, I imagine it's quite difficult. Lawrence can do it. Lawrence doesn't do his shoes out, though. He can't tie laces. Yeah, he can't tie laces. His dog, lack of opposable thumbs or disposable thumbs, like Julius Caesar. Only, only Project USA viewers will understand that reference. There's then a Velcro closure, which belongs very firmly in the 1980s, in my opinion, but it's basically a, a Velcro strap like this. Uh, they usually come in two or three iterations. The problem with these, I mean, so the benefit of them is that they're easy to get in and out of, uh, the, and they can also be adjusted on the fly. The problem being that it tends to create pressure points at, at, at the points in which the, the straps are, are located. More recently, last couple of decades, we've started seeing the advent or we started seeing the introduction of a boa closure, uh, which is a, a dial. There are, there are several iterations of these uh, and they allow you to micro adjust pressure over the foot. Uh, and there is usually, a, they can often be found, you can often find combinations of uh, boa and velcro. For anyone out there worried about the durability of this system, uh, I personally I've never had a problem with, with wires breaking. They do actually offer a lifetime warranty on them anyway. That's a, on the boa branded uh, boas. As you kind of move up the range in, 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 within brands, you tend to go from one boa, often accompanied by a velcro strap, to a, a double boa system, which again allows a, a better distribution of pressure over the top of the foot. Just going back to the fit of the shoe, this is what helps the shoe fit well. What we want from the shoe is for it to feel like your foot's being given a little hug. We want, um, we want contact at every point of the shoe, but no pressure. So the shoe should feel snug, not tight. So finally, cleat location. Now, I think the first thing to understand uh, and consider is that cleat location is different from shoe brand to shoe brand. There are some brands that have a very strong correlation with pain and injury, at, that have a very forward cleat location, forward place cleat location, some more in the middle, some are you know, quite a lot further back. Uh, Lake is sort of in the middle. Uh, certainly brands like Bont tend to have a more rearward cleat location. Most of the Italian brands tend to be more forward placed. The biggest piece of advice I would give to everyone about cleat location as a starting point, and this is not the be all and end all, but you can do no harm by having the cleat too far back on the shoe. Uh, it's worth noting as a side note that we have an entire video surrounding this. I think you're gonna put a link on it down below. The starting point, in my opinion, should be get the cleat as far back on the shoe as it'll go. On the grounds that you're getting pressure away from the forefoot. Now, just to dispel one myth that's been very common in cycling over the years is uh, there's a lot of, lot of content in various publications and possibly on YouTube about aligning the center of the cleat, which is also the center of the pedal axle, with the ball of the foot. If you do that, you will get foot pain, knee pain, and probably saddle issues too. What tends to happen is, well, ultimately it puts huge amounts of pressure through the forefoot. Uh, it's a method that is sort of derived from the 1970s when we were using uh, toe straps and clips uh, and toe clips. Uh, it has no real place in, in modern cycling, in my opinion. Uh, so this is why I tend to say, I, I, I tend to recommend people take the cleat as far back on the shoe as they'll go. In complete honesty, within most bike fits, I find myself taking the, the cleat as far back on the shoe as it'll go, which I feel is more of a testament to shoe design than it is about uh, my bike fitting methods. It's worth noting as a side note that if you take, if your cleat is placed as far forward on the shoe as it'll go, and you then take it as far back on the shoe as it'll go, you'll probably need to reduce your saddle height by five or 10 mil, all right? Because it's going to increase your leg extension, ultimately. The other thing that's worth noting, so first, first and foremost, I don't really ever add any rotation to the cleat like this, um, but you can move them from left to right. Now, if you are a bigger rider, if you're a rider that possesses a physiological trait known as tibial varum, which is a bowing of the tibia, which is extremely common, then you're probably going to need 
a wider stance. So what we're thinking about, what we've got to think about here, doing here is we're taking, the, we're moving the cleat inboard to take the shoe away from the bike. This is, and I find myself again doing this really very, very commonly. Again, over the last few decades, bicycles have become increasingly narrower, uh, mostly to aid people, uh, mostly to aid professional athletes to pedal through corners. As a result, I'm finding myself almost always needing to increase stance. And this has ramifications all the way up through the kinetic chain, even as far as increasing, sorry, reducing pressure up through the hands and the neck and the shoulders. If you're a smaller rider, very, very skinny, or a very small woman, for example, go the other way, get your feet close together. Uh, again, I, I, find, I don't find myself doing this very often, to be honest with you. So uh, as a starting point for smaller rides, I would actually probably have them set in the middle, but you, you could have a go at, uh, at, at reducing your stance if you are a small individual. We want to just give you a brief rundown of the different traits of, of different shoe brands. So if we start off with Shimano, which is a, I, I would call an average fitting shoe, works for a sort of CD, CDE width, which is what you would measure on a Brannock device. They offer a standard and a wide fitting option in most of their shoes. Uh, shoes to avoid in their range of the real entry level ones because the heel is really flexible, but they, they offer a nice neutral uh, fit with a good cleat location. Again, the cleat location is quite adjustable. You can get it really quite far back and they offer a range of different closure types. City, uh, very popular Italian brand. They've been making cycling shoes and motorcycle boots as well since the dawn of time. They are renowned for probably some of the best made cycling shoes, which is one of the best things about City, but it's also one of the worst on the grounds that it means that people tend to end up riding them for a lot longer than they ought to, uh, because the shoe tends to kind of just go saggy and soft and they end up feeling like a pair of slippers, which isn't really what you want from a cycling shoe. Uh, they offer, again, a number of different closures. They're a synthetic upper. They are, as I said a minute ago, exceptionally well made. The location's probably a little bit further forward than I'd like, but beautifully made shoe, and if you've got the right foot for it, then it'll work for you, you know, absolutely fine. Lake is without a doubt my favorite shoe brand. Uh, I've been working with them quite closely with them for the last few years. Uh, they offer, without a doubt, the widest range of fits. And so uh, they, they have several lasts. Within that last, they have several fits. They offer a standard fit, wide fit, extra wide fit across uh, all of their range and it's worth noting that not all late shoes fit the same as we as we alluded to earlier in the video uh, they have again multiple closure systems good stiff carbon soles right at the top end is the best shoe in, on the market in my opinion which is the CX403 which is what we both ride which is, has a, a, a an, uh, which has a series of options for the upper you can get it in usually a, a kangaroo hide, which is what I ride, but you also, you ride a, a vegan friendly PU, which is a Clarino uh, faux leather, uh, which, you know, equally good. They're both, they're both lightweight and breathable, and it's a full heat moldable custom shoe. Also available in custom options in terms of sizing uh, and, and uh, different widths per, per foot. So get in touch with me if you wanna have a look at that. You can also get different colors for them as well, custom colors which we've also both got. Specialized, hugely popular brand. Uh, they have some benefits, they have some negatives. The, the benefits are exceptionally well-made shoe. It's, it's really well put together. It's, again, it's kind of sort of almost the same as the city in that it's so well-made that it means that a lot of people ride them probably longer than they should do. Again, they've got different options for closure across the top of the foot. Uh, again, it's worth noting that the fit isn't the same in, in the specialized range. So for, for a sport road shoe, it's not gonna be the same as, as like a top end S-Works shoe. The, 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 the one slight negative I have with the specialist shoe in, this is something no one tells you and they do tell you, they make it sound like it's a good thing, is that it's the only non-neutral shoe. It has a four foot varus posting built into the front of the shoe. So essentially the front of the shoe is canted like this. Now that works for some people, Quite often I find myself having to either neutralize it or re replace the shoe altogether on the grounds that it puts quite a lot of pressure through the ball of the foot. Uh, I, I find that four foot correction doesn't really work that well in cycling, but that's just my findings. On the whole, 
well made shoe and if it works for you, great. Giro, probably best known for uh, their lace up shoe, the Empire, which I really like. It's The Empire, it's worth noting, is really only good for very, very narrow feet. In fact, to that end, I would say it's probably the best shoe on the market for narrow feet. Uh, however, the the rest of the shoes in their range, in my opinion, I don't really like because they tend to be using these these woven or knitted uppers, which are extremely lightweight. But when you apply that to a consumer who's sat at a desk all their life and their feet have gone to pot, they don't offer any support. Uh, furthermore, a lot of arch support and orthoses that we fit into cycling shoes are dependent on the structure of the shoe. If the shoe doesn't have much structure, it tends to destabilize the foot because the arch support doesn't provide enough support. So uh, I, I don't I don't have a huge love for, for the top end Imperial, even the, the new super light, um, super light Empire. But the entry level Empire with carbon sole, great shoe. Also worth noting the clean location is really, really good on Giro. It's really quite far back. Finally, Bont. Bont. So Bont, uh, Australian brand, uh, they made their name historically in, in rollerblades and ice skates, I believe, but they uh, are one of the best known heat moldable custom shoes. If you've got the right foot for a Bont, it, it works really, really well. But, and, when I, and by that I mean, uh, I'm gonna need a shoe for this. A Bont works particularly well for a Pez plainness foot. It's a low arch, low end step, usually rather harshly I feel referred to as a flat foot. And when I say flat, I mean the, four, the drop from the forefoot to the hind foot, sorry, the drop from the hind foot to the forefoot is, is, is relatively flat, all right? And this is something that the Bont, when you look at a Bont and compare it to this lake, the Bont is very, very flat. Um, what that means for individuals with a high forefoot drop is they tend to plant a flex, which again can destabilize the foot. Um, in, as, a, as a means of trying to make up for that, that lack of drop. They do come in a standard and a wide fit, and there's a whole range of range of options at, at different price points. Clean location is also very good. It's a heat moldable system, which means that you can bung it in the oven at a certain temperature, I can't remember what, and then mold it around your foot. That concludes today's episode of Bike Fit Tuesdays. James is available at his bike shop, which is Bicycle, the shop we're in right now, to do remote shoe fitting, and you can book a bike fit with him in person too. How can people find you? following the link below. But I think before we go, it's worth noting that anyone buying shoes from us is subjected to a foot assessment. Uh, we measure your feet, uh, we analyze your feet and assess your feet, and, and we recommend the shoe that's right for you. Rather than aimlessly going in and out of the shoe stock room to try and find something that's right, we'll actually do it in an informed manner. Uh, it's a 50 pound service, but it's refundable against a pair of shoes. Uh, we're gonna put a link to how you can book online for that. Uh, there is also a remote service that we offer. Again, we alluded to, we talked about this earlier, uh, where you can take up photographs of your feet and you can take some, your, some measurements at home, send them into us, and then we'll, again, we'll, it's a 50 pound service, which is discountable uh, or refundable against a pair of shoes via our online store. Subscribe to the channel for more episodes of Bike Fit Tuesdays, and if you have any topics that you would like covered, or any questions that you would like answered, put them in the comment section down below. Thank you for watching, goodbye.